Your uh, medical condition will require removal of some lymph nodes and it's important to understand what lymph nodes are, how they'll function um, uh, in their absence with the rest of your body working its way around that and some of the specific issues pertaining to an operation on the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes are a low pressure system that allows you to drain fluid up and out and get it back into circulation again. You are largely unaware of its function until you sprain your ankle or something. And all that swelling gets returned back to the circulation by little tiny channels that go past your joints and join lymph nodes, usually where your body bends behind your knee, in the groin, in your armpit. And that then directs the fluid back into circulation so that you can get rid of swelling when it occurs. Um, and it's a natural process. The lymph channel allows infections to spread and in the setting of lymph nodes, we're concerned about cancer spreading. Patients who have early cancers, many times we can detect cancer spread early by taking out the first lymph node that a, uh, a cancer goes to called the sentinel lymph node. In other patients, we need to be more radical and remove a block of lymph nodes, say in the armpit or in the groin, to control the spread of cancer and to cure the cancer. So those operations, the sentinel lymph node biopsy and the major lymphadenectomies all have potential risks associated with them that you need to be aware of that we are dealing with and doing the best we can to prevent with every operation on the lymph nodes. Because lymph nodes are accumulating in areas where the body bends, that's also areas where there are major blood vessels coming through. Um, and consequently, any lymph node operation, there is some potential for bleeding. I've had one patient in 25 years with an operation in the armpit for lymph nodes that required um, a reoperation or a blood transfusion. So it's uncommon, but certainly possible. But in the process of doing these operations, there's a big blood vessel in the armpit and a bigger one in the leg uh, that we're operating right next to that we need to be careful of and make sure that we don't get into any bleeding problems. Additionally, closing off a lot of blood vessels, many times we put little metal clips in there to keep those blood vessels permanently closed off, particularly the arteries. If you're on blood thinners, you have an increased risk of bruising uh, with these operations. Uh, but uh, the risk of bleeding is generally low if you have um, a religious or other reasons not to have a blood transfusion. Your surgeon needs to know because it is a potential with any lymph node operation. Um, infections are also a possibility with any operation involving lymph nodes. The armpit is automatically an area where there's an increased infection rate, as is the groin, uh, just more germs around and we're operating through those areas to pull out lymph nodes. Uh, we generally give you an antibiotic as you're going off to sleep. If infections arise, typically they'll show up one to three weeks later with pussy drainage, redness, increasing pain at the incision site. If that's the case, give me a call, text me a picture. I'm way cheaper and faster at dealing with that than an emergency room visit. But the infection rate with these operations is generally uh, one to two percent higher, a little bit higher in diabetics, uh, definitely a little higher if you're on chemotherapy already. When we take out lymph nodes, we leave a space where that lymph node used to be. Sometimes it's this big, sometimes it's this big. But that fluid that normally flowed through the lymph nodes can accumulate in that space and cause a seroma. Uh, when seromas form, usually it's a week or two after the operation, and you'll notice that you've suddenly grown this orange in your armpit or in your groin with obvious swelling. And the treatment for that is to put a drain tube in and drain it out. And it usually will take a week or two for that to resolve once that starts. Likewise, if that space fills up with oozing of blood, then you can form a blood clot in there and you'll, you'll develop a, a firm area of blood clot, usually within 24 to 48 hours of surgery. 
If you're on aspirin or blood thinners, you run at increased risk of this. Uh, people who are started on blood thinners uh, four days later can develop it right away at that point. Uh, so again, we're trying hard to close that space down, minimize any potential for any small blood vessels to bleed so that you end up with few of these kind of problems. Right next to all these big blood vessels that are close to the lymph nodes are also some big nerves. These nerves run your arm, they run your legs. Uh, I've never had a major nerve injury associated with any of these operations, but it's common to end up with numb areas, partly because of the incision, partly because of the nerves that run right next to the, the lymph nodes. Usually they're sensory nerves. If you have an operation in the armpit to remove lymph nodes, it is very typical to end up with numbness on the inside of the arm and on the lateral side of the breast over here. If you have in, in lymph nodes removed in the groin, many times there'll be a triangle-shaped area of skin that is numb in that area. Uh, but it's exceedingly rare to have injury to a motor nerve that results in paralysis or weakness. Uh, certainly it's a possibility. I've been fortunate not to have that complication, but it's possible. Now, by removing the lymph nodes, because of what they do, we're removing some of the capacity for you to move liquid back and forth throughout the body. And for every one lymph node that's removed, there's a 1% chance that downstream from that lymph node, you'll end up with some permanent swelling. That's called lymphedema, edema meaning the fluid collection coming from lymph, not from a heart failure or something. So back in the day when we always took out all the lymph nodes in the armpit for women with breast cancer, 10% of them would end up with permanent swelling of their arms because we were taking out 25 lymph nodes in the armpit. With a sentinel node procedure where we take out one or two lymph nodes, the chances of permanent swelling is one to two percent. With a major lymphadenectomy, it goes in the range of 10 percent. And the legs are a little more prone to that because the legs always are dependent and are more prone to swelling in the first place anyway. That permanent lymphedema may start showing up as soon as two months after the operation or it can take many years for it to develop. I had a patient just a couple of years ago who'd had her breast cancer operation 18 years ago and suddenly developed this swelling of her arm. The swelling needs to be dealt with to prevent it from getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, so if lymphedema starts occurring, um, let your oncologist know about it or let me know about it and we'll get you to a physical therapist and they'll work with some um, uh, squeezer devices, some exercises, and try and minimize that swelling. Some people end up with a permanent, or not a permanent, but a regular use of a compression stocking on their arm or their leg at night when the body's already trying to clear that fluid to help push it up and out of there. Uh, occasionally somebody will need to have that even during the day to keep the swelling down. Uh, but the swelling can be big enough to cause impairment of function because you, you can't move your joints fully and causes carpal tunnel and things like that. Uh, so that risk is uh, relatively low. We try and minimize that risk for many operations by doing the sentinel node process. So we're now taking out one or two nodes where we used to take out 20 or 25. Uh, but each node carries its own uh, fluid load. So uh, with your uh, lymph node operation. Uh, we're going to have answers as to what is in that lymph node typically four working days after the operation. So there's usually a little bit of pins and needles wondering and worrying about just what's going on uh, while we're waiting for that pathology report. Uh, we try to be sensitive to that and give you a phone call as soon as we have our pathology report so that you're, uh, you know what's going on and um, are able to, to move on from there. Uh, and generally, that then transitions with decision making to your oncology doctor and deciding the importance and how that uh, affects your other treatment options. Uh, the operation usually goes well. I've been in the game long enough that we did these operations as radical operations for years and years, and it's territory that I'm very familiar with, um, and I'm sure it will go fine for you.
Okay, now I've got a really unpopular subject and that is complications after surgery. All surgeries have potential complications. Some surgeries have different complications from others, but there are some that need to be watched out with every operation. One of those are things that people naturally are afraid of and that's bleeding. Uh, for most operations, the risk of bleeding is relatively low, amounts to bruising, and rarely results in transfusion. If you have religious objections to uh, blood products, be sure and let your uh, a surgeon know about that. But rarely do we need to proceed on with any bleeding trans transfusion sort of issues in general surgery and the stuff that I'm, I'm generally doing. But there are a few things that can increase your risk of bleeding that you need to be, be aware of. Aspirin increases bleeding, it increases bruising substantially, and unless your doctor feels like you need to be on aspirin despite the fact that you're having surgery, most patients will be taken off of aspirin. Uh, likewise, ibuprofen, Aleve, any of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories also have the same effect on clotting. So we'll generally have people off of those medications for a few days before surgery. External bleeding is very obvious. If you've got a spot of blood this big on your dressing, it's probably going to stop on its own. If your dressing, however, is soaked and looks like it's continuing, you need to notify your surgeon right away. Frequently that will get better just by applying pressure. But if it doesn't, it will need to be addressed during a, a close time frame there. Don't be polite to your surgeon. I like that if you are, but don't wait till morning if you've been bleeding all night. That can be a, a real problem. And uh, uh, let the surgeon know if you're soaking your dressings. The other way that you know you have bleeding uh, is something you might not think of up front. For most operations, we want you up and around the house the night of surgery. And walking is good, it prevents blood clots, it keeps you mobile, uh, but it also gives us an early warning sign. If you're attempting to walk the night of surgery and you're pale and you're passing out, that's either a heart problem or that's internal bleeding. That's an automatic trip to the emergency room and Nobody should talk you into going to bed because you're dehydrated, you just need to rest. If you're pale and passing out or just passing out, period, when you try and walk, that's internal bleeding and needs to be evaluated that night. Call 911, call me on the way. Infections are also a, 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 a risk with surgery. And anytime the intestines are cut across, there's a higher risk of infection. Um, Wound infections are not common at Meridian Surgery Center. The risk is about 1%. If your um, wound is red and angry, if it's draining pussy stuff, if you're having a fever over 101, those infections uh, symptoms are generally going to occur in the first week to three weeks after surgery. Uh, it's a nuisance. It might scare you, but it's probably not an emergency that requires an emergency room visit. And if you go to the emergency room, you're going to be there 10 hours. Um, call on the surgeon. Texting a picture is the better way to do it, way faster, way cheaper, and will save you a lot of trouble. I had a patient two years ago who was pacing in the emergency room with this problem. He'd been there four and a half hours. He was getting really mad. Other people were going ahead of him. He wasn't getting any attention. And he just went... <sighs> I'm supposed to be calling Dr. Wright. What am I doing here? Um, and we had it all, all figured out for him within 15 minutes. So um, be aware, the emergency room isn't generally the place for that kind of a problem. Let's get it taken care of. Anesthesia-wise, uh, your operation generally involves anesthesia. Local anesthetic has very minimal risks. But if you're allergic to lidocaine or bupivacaine in the dental office, we need to know that because that's what we're generally using, something related to that. Uh, general anesthetic and sedation procedures have uh, risk of anesthesia as well. Uh, we're generally evaluating that in the clinic as we go along with the surgery evaluation. And patients with high risk are generally done in the hospital setting. Patients with intermediate risks and low risks are in this out outpatient setting. But that's part of why we're doing blood tests and EKGs in evaluation before surgery. 
and sometimes you'll be set up for an outpatient surgery and those tests will either cancel the surgery and require a cardiac evaluation or change the setting of the surgery uh, or tell us something else needs to be done before the operation is done. But we deal with, um, uh, in the outpatient setting, minimizing the anesthetic risk and getting you through the operation as smooth as possible. You'll be speaking with the anesthesia provider specifically about your situation the day of surgery before you go in for surgery. If you have sleep apnea at baseline, we do ask you to bring in your CPAP mask because that can be helpful in the recovery phase when you're not breathing so well and when you're not, not as awake, uh, sort of like it helps you at night. Medications that we give after surgery can have reactions too, particularly if you've never seen them before. If you've had problems with certain pain pills before, we need to know that up front uh, so that we don't get you into the same trouble that you had before. But generally, narcotic pain medications are constipating. And the number one distress call I get uh, is usually four days after surgery. Somebody hasn't thought about how their bowels are working. They've had their surgery. They're doing okay. But now they can't poop. And it can be the most miserable part of your operation if you're bloated after an abdominal surgery and you can't poop and you can't, you have to push it out and nobody wants to give you an enema. Um, so you need to be proactive on that. So the night of surgery, drink plenty of liquids. When you're starting to eat, don't jump into meat and potatoes. Instead, fruit and vegetables. You want lots of fiber in your diet that will help you with your bowels in that immediate post-operative period. And if you're a constipated person in the first place, clean out before surgery, take laxatives, and keep your bowels working. You would rather have the trots in two days than bricks in four. But certainly keep an eye on it. If you normally have really good bowels, you don't even have to think about it, be thinking about it. If you haven't had a bowel movement in two days, you need to take a laxative and get things going and make sure that you don't get bound up. That's the best way to have a smooth operation after the operation. So when it comes to complications, nobody can tell you all the possible complications. There are a number of things that can go wrong. Your uh, informed consent forms will give you um, uh, a lot of answers there. Uh, but generally speaking, the more experienced your surgeon is, the less complications you're gonna have because they've seen things before and that experience helps them keep their patients uh, safe. Uh, so at Meridian Surgery Center, uh, you'll see a lot of experienced surgeons and providers uh, at your bedside uh, guiding you through your operation to minimize your potential for infection.